everyone. Tonight, I'm going to present to you all a harpsichord lecture recital featuring works by J.S. Bach, Handel, and Francois Cochrane. And my lecture today will focus on three main parts. Firstly, I will make a comparison between the modern piano and the harpsichord. And then I'll discuss the genre, style, and performance practice of Francois Cochrane. And lastly, I'll come up with a critical reflection and reception of Cochrane music historically and how does it influence the performance nowadays? And now let's take a look at um, the instruments next to me. It's harpsichord, which is an instrument widely used in Renaissance and Baroque period. And it is very similar to a modern piano in its wind shape. And also, um, as you realize, the keyboard here is a bit different. Like there are two manual harpsichords of audience sitting here might can take a look at it. And the color of it actually are very different because it is a reverse color of a modern piano, which is um, black at the bottom and a white um, on top of that. And uh, the touch of the harpsichord is actually much more lighter and shallow than a modern piano. And then for its mechanism, harpsichord is equipped with one to two strings made of wire, and it produces sound by plugging the strings with a quill when a key is depressed. And in contrast, piano has two to three sets of, of strings made of steel, and it produces sound by plucking the strings with a hammer. And while the hammer rebounds, the strings keep on vibrating, and therefore much more resonant sound is produced on the piano. And rather than the harpsichord, usually sound is um, pretty much lighter than piano. And then next, I'm going to move further to talk about the genre style of uh, Kuprin. Born in 1668 to 1733, Kuprin is regarded as one of the most influential composers of the Baroque era and was named the Great Kuprin by his contemporaries. He was born in a family of a very talent, full of talented musicians, and his talent was widely recognized that he worked for the royal court at that time and became the harpsichordist of the French king Louis XIV at that time. He composed more than 200 works for harpsichord, and they are all grouped into 27 orders, distributed through four books. And order is actually a French term to notate suite, which is pieces arranged in larger groups. So the piece I'm going to play tonight, the eighth order, is from his second book, published in 1717. Kuprin's order is unique from the traditional suite structure of J.S. Bach, that it doesn't follow the traditional pattern of Allemand, Sarabond, and Suite. And instead, for example, the eighth order I'm going to play is much larger in size. It consists of nine pieces in total. And it started with a French overture prelude, and then even non-dance derived movement like rondo are incorporated in the piece in the eighth order. And another special feature about this order is the use of programmatic titles which is rare for Haydn or even J.S. Bach. The scripted titles like um, refer to name of people, titles, places, are mentioned in Kuprin's pieces. For example, the eighth order I'm going to play, the prelude in the opening suggests the title uh, of the artist, Raphael, and the Allemand pieces suggest the title of ancient Italy, and the last, the Cerebon, has the title of Unique. So all this obscure title actually provides a lot of imaginations for um, performers. And actually, there's a lot of hidden meanings behind these um, titles. And there's a lot yet to be discovered by people nowadays, too. Despite all of this, the appeal of the music still remains so strong. And another special feature of Kuprin's music is the emphasis of sensitivity in a performance rather than virtuosity. Uh, which is very different from J.S. Bach or even Handel. His style of sensitivity is shown as a treatise called The Art of Playing Harpsichord, written in 1716. This treatise is very important as it explains technical terms, ornaments, and even gives detailed device on the execution of his own keyboard words. Kuprin wrote more than 20 kinds of ornaments, and he even wrote tables of ornamentations in his works, and a lot of them are actually very complicated. For example, um, there are ornamentations uh, like trios. 
or even faster, or a style called style brise, a French term for broken quartz. From the bottom to the top, or from top to bottom, or even turn. Okay. And all this, if you can imagine, is incorporated in a piece. It will sound very brilliant, actually. And Dr. Charles Burney, an English historian, once commented about Couperin's music, quote, his pieces are so crowded and deformed by beats, trills, and shakes, and nerve play notes were left to enable hearers to them for them to judge whether the tone of the instrument on which they were played was good or bad, end quote. And Couperin even expresses concern that many performers didn't notice his instructions about ornaments and proclaimed, quote, my pieces they ought to be played as I've marked them, and that they would never make a certain impression on a person of true taste, unless they have observed to be the letter in the letter everything that I have marked without adding or subtracting anything, end quote. Although Kubrin is very straight about the use of ornamentation in playing his music, he also gave a lot of freedom for performers in using in equal notes in his music. In French, we call it notes inégales. It means lengthening metrically important notes if notes and pairs they're written unslurred. And Kubrin once indicated, quote, the Italians set down the music in exact values where the French dot conjunct half notes, even though we notate them equal. And an example is the second Quran, which I'm going to play in Kuprin's um, eighth order. And the score is actually notated the right hand in a very equal eighth note value. And it's supposed to be played by musicians nowadays. Like. But if we add the notes in a gal, in equal notes, it actually should be played. It should be played very unevenly. And according to this treatise, there are different ways of showing the notes in a gal. There are mainly two types, which is long short notes. For example, in a scale, um, if long short notes apply, it should be another way is a short long. Okay. And although he got very strict rules about the notes in a gal, he also mentioned places where in, in equal notes is forbidden. For example, like movement marked move, movement marque, in places where they're very fast tempo or very slow tempo, um, notes in a gal is not preferred. And also Kuprin attempts to incorporate the French style overture over dotting style in his music. Notation such as dotted eighth note followed by three sixty-fourth notes is a very brave attempt to convey the majestic feeling of the French at that time. And also in this treatise, he also gave very detailed fingering instructions, such as finger substitutions, where he created a legato effect and is playing by changing fingers on the held notes in order to move smoothly to the next note. And legato effects is also achieved through a technique called um, glissando effect by sliding from a black to white key using the same finger. And his treatise actually is a landmark of piano pedagogy nowadays because his ideas of ornamentations, finger substitutions, and glissandos Actually, these techniques are widely accepted and used by pianists nowadays, and we all learn this um, um, at the very start of the piano lessons, too. And the reasons which account for Couperin's performance styles is mainly the influence of the French king, Louis XIV, at that time, who sought good taste and style in all kinds of art and music. An example is the highly decorative French style, which is shown by his complex ornaments, and the elegance is achieved through the notes in a gal in equal notes, and the grand majestic and the royal feeling of the French court as shown through this double dotted French style and the use of very rich and lush harmonies like five, nine, seven chord and dissonances in his music. And all these might lead people to question about the possibility of J.S. Bach and Handel to apply French style in the music because they all lived around the same time. And even early writers like C.P.E. Bach, he once agreed that the dot beside a note in Baroque music 
had a variable type value. And CPG box says, quote, short notes which followed dotted ones are always shorter in execution than the notated length. And short notes when they precede dotted ones are also played more rapidly than the notes notation indicated, end quote. Today's Handel music is considered to be the most cosmopolitan among all three composers as he successfully infused the French, Italian, and German style in his music. For example, the suite, which I'm gonna play, um, suite in D minor, is dealt off with a French unmeasured prelude, and what follows is actually a fugue. And this prelude and fugue structure is borrowed from J.S. Bach and probably much influenced by J.S. Bach, prelude and fugue, and it's well tempered clavier. And also the air at the later of the section shows the improvisatory Italian sweep and broad gestures of their music. And performers now, they have a lot of freedom to improvise Handel's music, like adding ornaments within the framework which is given by um, Handel. In contrast to Handel, J.S. Bach leaves very little for the performers to interpolate nowadays, as he notated almost all details on the music and even tiny details of um, melodic lines he has already written there. And this accounted for the control over the dense contrapuntal texture of J.S. Bach, which he liked very much. For Cooper's music nowadays, we still consider it very French in style, despite its attempt to blend the very best of Italian and French music with a style called Styles Reunited. J.S. Bach, Handel, and Couperin are very important figures at a time, but it is a pity to know that Couperin's music, his popularity just diminished after with the rise of modern piano nowadays. Um, compared to recordings of J.S. Bach, Prelude and Fuse, the recording for Couperin's is very scary nowadays. A reason to account for that is the very complex ornamentation and rhythmic system of Cooper's music become an obstacle for pianists nowadays to execute his music on a piano with greater key weight, deeper key descent, and richer overtones. And after all these years of um, performing harpsichord and piano in Hong Kong and the States, I personally find it better to perform Cooper's music on a harpsichord. And what I like about harpsichord is its very light touch, allows you to have very fast execution of its ornaments, which I just mentioned in my lecture, and to uh, bring out a very good taste of the French at a time too. And coming up, I'm gonna present to you a program with the Prelo and Fugue in D minor, BWV 875, from the Well-Tempered Clavier by J.S. Bach, Sweet in D minor, HWV 428 by Handel, and the selections from the eighth order in B minor by Kuprin. And I hope you guys will enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.